On this episode of AHA, learn the art of craft beer. We want the quality to be as good as the very best craft beers in the country. See the beauty in the brewery. I really wanted to know what was in there. When I got in, what I saw was amazing. Get a sneak peek into the studio of a nationally known fashion designer. For me, everything starts with color. Harley Davidson celebrates its 110th anniversary. Harley Davidson is one of those holdouts of our industrial heritage here in Milwaukee. A lot of these companies have come and gone, but we've really kind of stood the test of time. It's all ahead on this episode of AHA. Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Opalka, Robert and Doris fisher Malsardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At m and Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That is why we take an active role in our community. m and is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts, and we invite you to do the same. And this is AHA, a house for arts, a place for all things creative. Traditionally, we think of art as paintings, dance, and theatrical performances. Our show today looks at where art and craft meet. You'll see that it can be found in the unlikeliest of places. One of those unlikely places may be a craft beer brewery. Let's take a look at Schmaltz Brewery in upstate New York, where we find art and beer labels and craft in the company's brews. This is the kind of company you get when you let an English major dream up a beer company. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm the owner of Schmaltz Brewing Company in Clifton Park, New York. We don't have formal mission and vision statements like we would in a uh, venture capital business model. This has been a very organic project for 17 years, creating Schmaltz Brewing Company. We come up with beers that are more based on concept and creativity than on market needs or trends or things like that. We're really into making these special products for ourselves and for the people that we love to drink beer with. There were a couple of kids in my school that were Jewish, myself one of them, growing up in an area that wasn't particularly Jewish at the time in Northern California. And we thought, we need our own beer. What if we had one and be the only Jewish celebration beer in the country? We call it Hebrew. Punchline would be don't pass out, pass over. A little bit later, about 10 years later, when I was in my late 20s, I had the bug and I just started looking into what it would take to make a little bit of beer and call it Hebrew. It worked out to find what's called contract brewing. And it was just an opportunity to celebrate my own culture and what I was proud of and interested in. The very first batch of Hebrew Genesis Ale was 100 cases, hand bottled, hand labeled, delivered around in my grandmother's car because I didn't own a car at the time. It's been, you know, an endless series of challenges and, and adjustments because I never came from a brewery background. I didn't have a business background. And when you're trying to schlep around the country selling a beer called the Chosen Beer, and you've got a dancing rabbi looming over a landscape from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Stones of Jerusalem, it's a very different endeavor than home brewer turned, you know, professional brewer with a dog or a fish or rolling hills, which is very typical of craft beer. I've tried to jam as many punchlines as I possibly could onto beer labels, but at the same time, we really take the beer seriously. It is supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be unique, it's supposed to be super creative, but we want the quality to be as good as the very best craft beers in the country. I did not get into this industry to own stainless steel tanks and pay the mortgage on an enormous warehouse. I got into it because I was excited about the product and the creative process and, and being able to share these wonderful beers on the shelf and in people's pints. I was very happy as a contract brewer and it's still an important part of the industry. So the death of a contract brewer I thought up as a fun celebration and a way to riff on the concept. Brewed with seven malts, seven hops, 7% 7 alcohol. We released the beer on July 7th, 7-7, and we had it for our first anniversary party, our grand opening here at the brewery. It was such a hit that we decided to make it into a year-round beer. 
So I'm really excited. It's a delicious black IPA that came out of the gates with very high ratings on the largest beer websites in the country and continues to grow. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. I think people love having products that have uniqueness and personality that stand out on the shelf, that talk to you in a different way, and it's not really about traditional beer marketing, which, you know, Super Bowl ads and dancing girls and fast cars, and this is really more about a sense of artistry and a sense of creativity and being able to do something, we call it handcrafted, but it's, it's every element of the product and the project that is handcrafted as well, down to the images that we put on the labels. Our master brewer, Paul McElaine, spends hours so that the flavors that are gonna come through are something that's really spectacular and reflects the concept of the beer in the first place. The brewing side is a combination of art and science, and we're really lucky that I have such a great scientist who has this real compelling palette of artistry. We're also really proud of the art that we put on the outside of the label, and I've been working with the brewmaster and the artist for now over a decade on recipe development and translating that into images on the outside of the bottles. It's definitely one of the most fun parts of my job, is to be able to collaborate with these incredibly creative professionals that have brought so much to the Hebrew beer brand and the Schmaltz Brewing Company. Since we're small, we can't afford to make mistakes. We experiment with a sense of integrity, honesty, just like everybody, but we also have a lot of experience behind it. The flavors from the malts, the richness in the mouthfeel, the, the beautiful hop aromas and the flavors that can come from the pine and the citrus, the way those dance with the punchlines and the vocabulary on the outside and the images that are in the labels, and then how that goes into the market, bars, restaurants, and bottle shops around the country how we interact with other brewers and other brewing professionals and the people in our community that we're participating with, that is all, I think, a sign of success. And it goes back to the flavors in each individual beer. And hopefully that entire channel is something that we're really proud of and that we get to share with all these people that are out there and call it Great Craft Beer. Schmaltz certainly does make beer into an art form. Next, artists tend to focus on the details bringing life to their creativity. For a Wisconsin photographer, inspiration came from the details of iconic Wisconsin breweries that were decaying before his eyes. I'm looking for the signs of life that still exist and to share them with everyone. Everyone can kind of get a feel for what, what it was like to work here and what it was like to be part of this amazing place. You wonder what's in there. You know, you drive by an abandoned building and you want to know, wonder what's inside there. And then take an amazing place with a lot of history, like the Pabst or Schlitz. Who wouldn't want to see what's in there? My name is Paul Bialis and I am a photographer. Um, it's, it's a hobby, but it's really growing and uh, continues to get bigger and bigger. I really enjoy it. About four years ago now, uh, I was driving through Milwaukee and found these buildings downtown here at the Pabst Brewery. The buildings are amazing and that became my first project and took a lot of pictures down here and it, it, it turned into something I felt I really had to share and it turned into a book. I wanted it to sit on my coffee table at home and, and let people enjoy it. And then somebody else said, well, I'd like a book and then another person. And as all of a sudden a hundred people wanted books, I started spending more time making the book because more people were going to see it. Well, the first thing was the pap sign and the look of the buildings. I mean, because it's, it's the stained Cream City bricks that are outside of them and they're all dark now, it, it just felt like you're in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and there's no place else you can get that feeling. Once I had taken a lot outside, had some great photos, I had had to get inside. I really wanted to know what was in there. And when I got in, what I saw was amazing. I felt like an investigator. I'm trying to find things in these photos that bring to life these buildings, the employees, the stories they told. So a lot of the images you'll see are the, uh, maybe it's a pep sticker on something or you know an employee. There's one of them where there's a you know, like the employee of the month, or it's like an overtime hour sheet. 
there are a lot of rooms that are that kind of appear just as when the workers left. And uh, the break room image is probably my favorite in the Pabst book. We have the lockers. I love that this one has her name on it, Esther. This is Esther's locker. Louise is over there. All the signage on the lockers here from the employees. You know, one element on the table there was or is a Harnish Baker ice cube tray. There's an empty pack of cigarettes on the table, a Pabst bottle, there's a steak escape mug. Um, there's a calendar in the corner that says 1985 on it still. Here, look at, there's still things in the lockers over here. We want to tell the, the story of the employees. So how can we do that? You know, by looking at, taking the picture, including the table and including the lockers. And it's going to tell the story of the workers, their break time. I mean, it's just as they left it when they walked out. That's part of the reason I did the whole project. I, I never got to take a tour through the Pabst Brewery. And being able to kind of get a feeling for what the workers were like, that's something I strive for in the book, telling the story of, of the people of Pabst that you know, we don't have anymore. Paul came here, I think, just uh, curious as a, a customer in our gift shop. And uh, as he said, just fell in love with the buildings and was surprised to see that there was one open and came in one day. And he's such a, a likable guy, we quickly hit off a friendship. And then he mentioned that he'd love to take photographs. And I was sort of surprised, because I thought he'd be taking ornate pictures of some of the most beautiful spaces. And was quite surprised to see almost the exact opposite of him looking for the worst peeling paint, the worst situations. And I started to say, well, Gee, I thought this was going to be about the beauty of the place, but uh, I came to see the beauty in capturing those peeling paint type pictures. The infirmary is like something out of a horror movie, and uh, that's a really neat place. And you see these old drapes, and they still say Pabst on them, and the bed is old, and you know there's broken tiles on the floor, and it, to me it was just an amazing place to stand, and that was. Just walking into that room for the first time and seeing what was there and what could be saved on film and the story it told to me was an amazing, amazing thing. And when I finished Pabst, a historian contacted me and said, I can get you access into the Schlitz Brewhouse, which is set to be demolished any month now. Kind of take it or leave it. And I thought, this is perfect. You know, it, it fits so well. So I dropped everything I was doing grabbed the camera, went down, and started shooting. The same feeling, you walk in and it's just this giant open area. And what was amazing about it is I'm walking up the steps of this just amazing building and, and you're taking in all the history and it's just silent, you know, you're the only one there. And when you get up to the top, there's this huge American flag hanging over in the brew house. It was good to see it be photographed and, and uh... Uh, the way Paul did it. Uh, you could actually smell the beer in, in some of these pictures, pick up the aroma. And it, the pictures do say a lot, and I'm very proud of what he's done. One photo is a picture of the brew house looking up at the skylight. The skylight was a very important aspect of the architectural history of that, that brew house, as it was with most buildings built in that era. The skylight was still intact at the time Paul took these pictures. Another thing that, that stood out was the ornate ironwork of the steps. It was a multi-level building, and it was an ornate ironwork that really set this building apart from most other buildings built in that era. I remember just sitting down, you know, both in the Pabst Brew House and the Schlitz Brew House, and you kind of just, just sitting in, in the quiet, giant room, and you kind of just take it all in, and it's just a wonderful feeling. I hope that you know they get a feeling of how great these breweries were in Milwaukee and what it was like during that time period when these were the you know the largest breweries in the world and you couldn't go to a dinner or or not know someone who didn't work for the brewery and what was that like you know what was this time period like what were the breweries like you know another takeaway is like the ornateness of the buildings you know as you'll see in the photographs Think of the late 1800s, you know, our forefathers, what did they, how did they build? You know, when they built something, it was going to last a thousand years, 
and there was going to be decorative, stylative things put in all of it in intricacy. And this book, both books, preserve that. There really is beauty in the decaying industrial world. Our next segment features a Houston, Texas designer with a tropical take on handbags. In this segment, we learn about what inspires the designs and brand. I was very influenced by my mom and her design sense and um, you know she really looked at fashion as a form of self-expression so she really encouraged that as like an art form and when I got into my early 20s I went to University of Texas and I was doing marketing and advertising and she was always kind of mentioning fashion like why aren't you pursuing that so I just kind of had this moment when I was like 21 I was getting ready to graduate I was like you know you're right like what am I doing I need to do this this is a passion of mine and really what I knew more than anything was that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to start my own business saw the accessories business really coming into its own, I realized, you know, that's a great way to express yourself is design these, you know, three-dimensional shapes and really come up with these great items and show your design aesthetic. I think every designer has their own unique way of how, the, how they get to that final product, but for me, everything starts with color. So that's just how it's always been for me, and when I start a season, I go straight to my color resources and start developing color palettes that really inspire me through each delivery. And then I sort of usually come up with a muse or a destination of what sort of all of that is saying to me. So for example, if, you know, really breezy kind of mid-tone pastels are in, I might say, you know, this is something that's really making me feel like St. Bart's. So then we'll start kind of rounding out the picture through maybe a place or a person. I really feel like storytelling is like a huge part of what I do and it's something that really inspires me um, because I think that it takes, it gives the product more meaning. It almost places the product in a place and time for her. It might bring her back to a childhood vacation that she took, you know, as a young girl. Like I want my products more than anything to kind of communicate these dreams for her and, and just evoke these emotions more than just these tangible, oh yeah, that's a cute bag. I want her to walk up and feel something. And that's really what we're here to do. So after we develop our color palettes, we come up with our materials, you know, we start sourcing all of our materials, you know, over the, across the globe. Um, and then we sit down and we start the prototype process. We come up with what we really love and then we submit that to our factory. And then they develop the prototypes and send them back to us. And then we make our changes here and there. And then we go into the sample phase after we make that final decision. Okay, these are the bags that we're gonna go forward with. These are the shoes that we believe in. And we do all, I mean, it's a long process. That's why in design you work so far ahead is that everything takes so long. So for example, right now we have resort on the floor, but I'm just finished designing next year's holiday. So I'm a year ahead, so I'm doing resort for next year. So ultimately what drives a business is people. It's not just budget sheets and profit and loss sheets and all that, it's really, you know, creating this incredible team and everybody sort of has this mission, you know, we're all of one mind, you know, and I think that that really what, that's why I wake up every day is for the people, not because, you know, I love the color coral, it's because I love people and I want us all to kind of go on this journey together. Those are wonderful creations. Now, let's switch gears and hit the high road with Harley Davidson Motorcycles. To celebrate its 110th anniversary, the Harley-Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin gives us a tour. Watch as the curator of the museum explains how this motor vehicle is more than just a machine. People get a connection to Harley-Davidson that goes beyond just the tangible. Of course, these are motorcycles, they're transportation vehicles, but there's something that goes a lot further beyond just the use of the vehicle. My name is Kristen Jones and I'm the senior curator for the Harley-Davidson Museum. The museum came together in 2008, that's when we opened our doors to the public, but the idea for the museum has been around for much longer than that. The, the collection of the Harley-Davidson archives has been around since the 19-teens and we have an extensive collection that ranges from the earliest days of the motor company from 1903 to the present time. 
There's so much here for people to enjoy. Um, some of my particular favorites are the earliest catalogs, uh, some of the galleries that talk about the founding of the company with serial number one, the oldest known Harley Davidson. We have a lot of things that also talk about the culture of riding and the cultural history of riding. Some of my personal favorites are the club uniform jerseys. We also have a lot of different personal stories that we tell in the museum, things about different writers. For instance, a young woman who in 1929 took a solo trip from Georgia to Milwaukee and back. Her name was Vivian Bales, and we have a lot of materials that talk about her story and her personal experience being a young woman on the road alone. This year for the anniversary, we've done a special exhibition entitled Designing a Celebration. And this gives people a behind the scenes glimpse into the development of the logos that we use for the celebration and also some of the special products. We do a limited edition motorcycle for each anniversary and it's a very special piece, highly collectible. And we gave people a glimpse into the design and engineering of that product. There's a real cultural significance to Harley Davidson as most of us know. And a lot of that comes from the ideas of personal freedom, the idea of being out on the road, the idea of camaraderie. All of those things are kind of enveloped within our machines. But personalization is also a big deal for Harley Davidson, and that's something I think that resonates with people. We have motorcycles that are highly personalized here, and they range from people who've added just a few things to things that are really rolling sculpture. One of my favorites is the King Kong motorcycle, and this is a double-engine knucklehead vehicle that really is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's something that was done by a gentleman out in Pennsylvania. He was a real folk artist and created this vehicle to ride it in parades. There are a lot of classic motorcycles here that were used by different personalities. In fact, we have a replica piece from Evil Knievel. Some of the other more familiar bikes that people will see is Captain America from Easy Rider. When someone comes to the museum, they can take their own path. They can really decide what they want to see and when. We have, of course, a chronological display of all the motorcycles, but we also have historical galleries that really put Harley Davidson in the big picture context of what's happening in American culture at the time. Some of the things that they definitely shouldn't miss, of course, are the Tsunami motorcycle, which has a wonderful, poignant story. And this is a bike that floated across the ocean and a year and one month after the tsunami struck in Japan, it was found on an island off of the coast of British Columbia. And, you know, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that piece. Something else that's not to miss for sure is our board track display. Now these bikes were run on wooden tracks that had 45 degree steep banked angles. People didn't have brakes, they were slick with oil, and you can hit up to 100 miles an hour on the straightaways. So as you can imagine, a very harrowing experience. Harley Davidson is one of those holdouts of our industrial heritage here in Milwaukee. A lot of these companies have come and gone, but we've really kind of stood the test of time. And it's something that I know a lot of people in the community are proud of to have here. Milwaukee played a central role in the growth and development of Harley-Davidson. I don't think the founders would have been able to do what they did if they hadn't been in Milwaukee. In fact, in the early part of the 20th century, Milwaukee was known as the machine shop of the world. Now, the founders were working in a very small shed behind the, the Davidson family home. It was only 10 feet by 15 feet. But they had all of the resources that they needed, machine shops, tanneries, et cetera, right in their own neighborhood. So that really helped to facilitate what they were doing. Harley-Davidson, of course, stretches far beyond Milwaukee and has become a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, Harley-Davidson was in about 67 countries around the world by 1920. So we really spread our wings outside of the Midwestern United States very early on. And it's not just the fact that these bikes were sold, but the fact that people recognized the brand, people knew that there was something special about the brand, something that went beyond the tangible. We're the only American motorcycle manufacturer who's been around for 110 years. That's a pretty important thing. And it's something that we, we are looking to celebrate. We started our anniversary celebrations really with the 85th anniversary and have continued that tradition every five years. And 110 years, that's a real milestone. For people who are celebrating the 110th birthday of Harley Davidson, the museum is not to miss. The museum is really where all of the history is held. It's the spiritual home of, of Harley Davidson. And you know, it's something that's not to miss. There's so much to see here. People can participate. In fact, one of the uh, most popular exhibits here is a sit-on gallery, what we call the experience gallery, where people can throw a leg over a motorcycle, people who maybe have never even had the opportunity to do so.
One thing I would want people to experience upon coming here is that it's not just about the motorcycle. There's so much to see here. There's so much that resonates with people from art history to graphic design to the history of technology. It's more than just a machine. There's no question that those machines are works of art. And that wraps it up for this edition of AHA. For more arts and culture, visit WMHT.org slash AHA, where you'll find features about our creative world in our backyards and across the country. Until next time, I'm Katie G. Thanks for watching. Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Opalka, Robert and Doris Fisher Malsardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At MT Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That is why we take an active role in our community. MT is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts, and we invite you to do the same.